Let's do a full bifurcation analysis of a linear system. So this is going to be section 3.7. We're going to work on number four together. So the linear system in question written in vector form is the vector y dt equals the matrix capital A has entries little a, little a, one and zero. And that gets multiplied by the vector y. Of course, as always, the vector y has components little x, little y. And so you should be able to write this in scalar form as well. And in fact, I'll do that quick. dx dt equals ax plus ay, and dy dt equals just one times x. These are equivalent to each other. So what do we want to do with this? Well, the directions say to sketch the corresponding curve in the trace determinant plane. In a brief essay, describe the different kinds of behaviors exhibited by the system, and then identify values of A where the system changes. Those would be called bifurcation values. This is a bifurcation analysis. The number of equilibrium points doesn't typically change in this kind of situation, except for the fact that at one value of A, it's possible we could have actually infinitely many equilibrium points, but they they kind of appear briefly and then go away as the bifurcation occurs. So the trace is the sum of the numbers in the main diagonal. A plus zero is A. And the determinant, as always, is product of the numbers in the main diagonal, A minus zero minus the product of the numbers in the off diagonal, one times A. That gives zero minus A is negative A. So the point T comma D in terms of the parameter A is A comma negative A. And in the trace determinant plane, which is not a phase plane, right? Don't ever think this is a phase plane. All this is is a tool to help us figure out bifurcation values. That's all it is. It's a nice tool. There are three critical loci, the t-axis where d is zero. So when the determinant is zero, that's when a bifurcation can occur. When the determinant is zero, that is the situation where the origin is degenerate, you might say. In fact, there end up being infinitely many equilibrium points, not just one at the origin. Because the matrix, when the determinant is zero, is gonna be singular. What does singular mean? Do you remember? It means non-something, non, non-invertible. And when it's not invertible, that's when its kernel is bigger than just the trivial zero vector. The kernel of the linear transformation that corresponds to this matrix is the same as the set of equilibrium points. It's typically going to be a line through the origin, infinitely many points on it. Another important critical locus of these three critical loci is the positive d-axis. T is zero and d is positive. When you cross that, when you're on that, when the trace is zero, you've got purely imaginary eigenvalues and the origin is going to be a center. Your formulas for solutions will only involve cosine and sine, no exponential growth or exponential decay. And then there's the repeated root parabola with equation d equals t squared over four, which is equivalent to four d equals t squared. When you touch that, that's when there's one real eigenvalue and only one line of straight line solutions. What if you're touching all three? What if you're at the origin? Well, for sure, there's going to be infinitely many equilibrium points. Could it get even stranger than that? We'll have to see if that happens in this case, at least. Okay. What you want to do is you want to trace out this curve in the trace determinant plane as A varies. We did that for a second order harmonic oscillator on Wednesday. And we saw it was a line going horizontally to the left as the parameter B increased. And we went from a center to a spiral sink to a 
real sink. Undamped is the center, no damping. Underdamped is when you have the spiral sink, not much damping. Overdamped is over here when you have the real sink. Two straight line solutions, no spiraling. The boundary between those is called critically damped. Mathematically speaking, it's important, but physically speaking, you'd never observe it in real life. But in general, for a general linear system, we're not talking about a harmonic oscillator here. You also could be over here where you have spiral source or over here where you have a non-spiral source or down here when the determinant is negative, the origin could be a saddle point. What happens for this example if I allow both negative and positive values of A? Think about this point. How does it move through this plane as A increases? T equals A, so T would increase. But D equals negative A, so D would decrease. And no matter what A is, for this point, you've got to be on the line D equals negative T, right? Since T equals A and D is negative A, D also equals negative T. You've got to be on the, the line to the origin with a slope of negative one. But again, it's more than just the, that line that you're on. The line D equals negative T. It's also a direction as A increases, you're moving to the right because T increases and A decreases. That's what happens in this example. It's possible with other examples, you could be going backwards along, along that line. And T would decrease as D increases. That's possible. Don't rule it out. So it looks like over here, I mean, we can do part B right now. We did, we did part A here. We sketched the curve in the trace determinant plane. Over here, the origin is going to be a spiral, uh, excuse me, a real sink for values of A that are small enough that you're over here. There'd be negative values of A. And you could draw a little quick phase plane. Where are the straight line solutions? We can't really say without doing more work. You don't need to draw a precise picture here other than just to draw straight line solutions that head toward the origin to make it a, a sink, a real sink, and maybe something like this. Just a generic picture of a real sink. When A is such that you're in here, A is still negative, but only slightly so, then the origin is a spiral sink. Real sink over here, spiral sink over here. Some bifurcation value happens when you cross the repeated parabola. But then another bifurcation happens when you cross the origin and come down here. And when you're down here, the origin is a saddle point. Saddle point. And a generic picture would have one straight line solution with arrows pointing toward it and another one where arrows point away and other solutions would look like this. Is that big enough? Can you see that? I got arrows going toward it along this line, arrows going away from it along this line, and other solutions have to follow those other arrows. Again, for this particular system, I don't know exactly where the straight line solutions are yet. I'll try to figure them out. Now we want to find the bifurcation values. Then we'll use Mathematica to animate all of this, to see it happening before our very eyes. And then we'll also talk about how is this related to change of coordinates and diagonalization, okay? The big thing is we're relating it to that. Well, certainly one bifurcation happens when A is something very simple. What is, what's the simple value of A that gives you a bifurcation value? Zero. Yeah, you'd be at the origin there. That's when A is zero. What's not as simple is when you cross over there. But just use the equation, 4D equals T squared, substitute in T equals A and D equals negative A, 
self ray. 4D will be four times negative A and T squared will be A squared. So we're trying to solve the equation negative four A equals A squared. One solution is A equals zero. To find the other solution, it's good to add four A to both sides, factor out an A. Looks like the other solution is A equals negative four. The bifurcation values are A equals negative four and zero. You're right there when A is zero, you're right here when A is negative four. Say it again, once again, this TD plane, trace determinant plane is not a phase plane. It's just a tool to help us see pretty quickly what the phase plane is going to look like as A changes. If A is less than negative four, then you've got your real sink. If A is between negative four and zero, then you've got your spiral sink. And if A is bigger than zero, then the origin is a saddle point. All right, here, let's use Mathematica now and confirm this happens. I will go ahead and enter the matrix A. I'll call it capital A, but it's a, it's a function of little a. So A of A equals, press the matrix button on the palette. You can get the, the palette through the palettes menu. A, A, one, zero is our matrix. <clears throat> I will find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but not yet. Let's just enter this. I don't have to have the semicolon there. It's sort of a habit. Semicolon suppresses output. But to see the phase plane change as A changes, the quickest thing to do is to use stream plot and put it inside manipulate. Manipulate can animate, for example, stream plots as A changes. It can animate lots of other things too. Stream plot inside there with capital S and a capital P. We're trying to graph a vector field here, essentially, or solution curves to the vector field. The syntax is to have the vector field in here. I typed f of x, y there, but I'm going to erase it here in a second. Whatever the vector field is, that you would be what you plug in there. The quickest way to write the vector field once we've got our matrix A is to write it as capital A of little a, period, in curly braces x, y. That does this matrix times a vector x, y, really, that's represented in mathematics as a column vector. It's really a column vector. The period is what, how you do matrix multiplication, not a star. This is the matrix A times the column vector x, y. This is the vector field. I mean, I could even do this. I could copy and paste that up here and see what it looks like. There it is, AX plus AY in the first component and X in the second component, just like I have here, the right-hand sides. Oh, let's let X go from negative five to five, same for Y. After that square bracket there, put a comma, and then in curly braces, put a comma negative 10 to 10, say. Enter that. Okay, I'm gonna, I like getting rid of the frame around it. So after the y comma negative five comma five, I'm gonna put another comma and type frame with a capital F arrow false with a capital F, and then add an axis as well, put a comma, axis with a capital A, arrow true with a capital T. And also label the axes. I won't take the time to do that. A is starting out at negative 10. 
You can see the origin, looks like a real sink. Although one thing that might be a little confusing if you're not careful is it kind of looks like there only, only might be one straight line solution along this line here with a slope close to negative one. That's a bit deceiving. There's actually another one right about along this, whole, this line here. If I'm going to draw a better phase plane, I'd also want to draw a big dot at the origin to emphasize the origin is an equilibrium point. I won't take the time to do that. <clears throat> Let's let A increase. We see the origin continuing to be a sink. It is a real sink. It's not looking too much different yet. It's when A cross is negative four that a bifurcation occurs. It's not a bifurcation in the number of equilibrium points. It's a bifurcation in the nature of the equilibrium point from a sink, a real sink, which it still is right now. One straight line solution about like this. The other one, not too far away. It's like those straight line solutions are merging. And in fact, that's what happens at A equals negative four exactly which I can just type in here and enter it. There's only one straight line solution there, though it's hard to tell for sure, just looking at the picture. Once A is slightly bigger than negative four, like negative 3.82 or negative 3.8, the origin's actually a spiral sink, though you can't really tell very easily by looking at the picture. It, does, it still doesn't look that much different. But we know from our bifurcation analysis that it's gotta be a spiral sink here. There's gotta be some spiraling. Evidently, since we can't really tell that it's spiraling, evidently the exponential decay is strong enough compared to the speed of the spiraling, you might say, that you can't tell. These do go around the origin, but they're, they're so close once they start going around that you can't even see them anymore. However, once A gets close enough to zero, I bet we can tell. Yeah, now once A is here, negative 1.96, it seems more clear that there's spiraling going on. Spiral sink, it gets stronger, more spiraling, you might say, the closer A gets to zero, the exponential decay part of the solution formula is weaker. What's happening to the eigenvalues here? What's happening to the eigenvalues? Okay, imagine the complex plane. Okay, here's the horizontal real axis. Here's the vertical imaginary axis. The eigenvalues, their real parts are still negative, but they're getting closer to zero. They're moving closer to the imaginary axis. So they're real parts. And in fact, their imaginary parts are moving closer to zero as well, because once A passes zero, then somehow this has got to morph into a saddle point. Boy, that's unclear how that's going to happen. Here we're getting pretty close to the bifurcation value. Still spiral sink there at the origin, though it's it seems to be kind of a weak spiral sink. It's hard to tell that it's going toward the origin necessarily anymore. Here we're just barely less than zero. Technically, the origins of the spiral sink, but we are close to having infinitely many equilibrium points. And it looks like probably those infinitely many equilibrium points, once A is zero, are going to be along the vertical axis here, I'm guessing. Because you got solutions going almost straight up to the right and almost straight down to the left. I bet when A is zero, they go exactly straight up and straight down. And in fact, the vertical y axis, though you can't tell from Mathematica, becomes a line of equilibrium points. I bet that's what happens. Once A is positive though, even slightly so, the origin becomes a, a saddle point. Let's see what, what happens when A is barely positive. You can start to tell it's a saddle point even when A is 0 0.01. And becomes a much stronger saddle point, point, so to speak, when A is bigger than zero, significantly bigger than zero. Let's go ahead and find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors now. We'll just use Mathematica. 
I'll go ahead and just do Eigen System. By the way, if you didn't know this, you can certainly go up and re-enter things. The input output labels get changed if you do. I can put Eigen System up here if I like. I'd have to type it like that. Both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are going to depend on A in a fairly complicated way. That maybe shouldn't be surprising. These two numbers, these are two numbers, are the eigenvalues. And these two vectors, this first vector and this second vector, are the two eigenvectors. Catch that again? This is an eigenvalue right here. This is a second eigenvalue. This entire list right here, notice there's something there, comma one is an eigenvector. And this entire list right here, something comma one is another eigenvector. And they match up. This eigenvector goes with this eigenvalue. This eigenvector goes with this eigenvalue. Are the eigenvectors always real? No. If A is between zero and negative four, they're not real. When A is like negative one, for example, that's the square root of negative one, I. When A is less than negative four, like negative five, you still got a square root of a negative number here and a square root of a negative number there. Evidently, those cancel out to give you a real number when you multiply them. So we have real eigenvectors and eigenvalues when A is less than negative four over here, and also when A is positive. Complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors in here when A is between negative four and zero. Could I get the eigenvectors in the picture to maybe help me see the straight line solutions better? Yeah, I think you could probably do that. Do you all get the stream plot to work? Okay, I'm going to mix the stream plot with another graph. So I need to use show. I'm putting the word show in front of stream plot there and put in the n square bracket for the show here. Well, actually, let's see. Instead of putting this n square bracket there, I'm going to put it here, right after this one. So I'm going to close off effectively the, the stream plot right there. Because I like keeping my frame and act, arrow false and axis arrow true outside of the show. That's the reason I'm doing it. Well, outside of the stream plot, excuse me. Put another comma. I'd like to draw some arrows. Graphics will do it. So type graphics and then square brackets. If it's never occurred to you to do this, do what I just did there. Put the starting square bracket and the ending square bracket right away. A common mistake people make with Mathematica is forgetting square brackets or, or curly braces. So I want to try to prevent that mistake. So I put both of those there. Then inside here, I'm going to put syntax that'll make some arrows. I'm going to put a starting square bra uh, curly brace and an ending one. Oh, what should I do? How about thick with a capital T, arrow with a ca uh, capital A, although let's see, let's do uh, arrow heads first. I'm not sure what number to put in here. Let me try point one. And then arrow, notice there's commas between these things. And what am I trying to do? I'm trying to graph the eigenvectors in the same picture to help me see where the straight line solutions are. Not the null claims. The eigen, I'm trying to draw the straight line solutions. I think I just copy and paste this. Those are the eigenvectors. Should be able to just copy and paste that in, and put it inside the arrow. I think this will work. So I copied it, click down here, paste it. Uh, I forgot an extra curly brace. You need 
two curly braces over here and you need two ending ones over here. There's also another curly brace that matches with this one. When you highlight them, you can see what they go, they go with. This curly brace goes with this one because this is green over here and this is green over here. These curly braces go with these two. Ignore the fact that that's green, I guess. I think I think I did it right. I think there's no mistakes there. Let's see what it produces. Hopefully no errors. Nope. Uh, okay, no, that's not gonna work. All right. Um, I need to do something else here. Okay, I know what I did wrong. Get rid of what's inside the arrow. Let me just copy and paste one of these. After I've also typed in curly braces, zero, zero. I'm doing a bunch of copying and pasting. If you try to do it like me, you're very likely to make a mistake. So maybe you just want to type this. There's what I typed inside the arrow with with some copying and pasting. If it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. I'm not grading your Mathematica. I can help you fix it after class. Okay, there's the arrow. And I think my arrow head's too big. Let me make this point one something smaller, like point zero five. That's parallel to a straight line solution. And you can see it moving as A changes. Oh, this must be the situation where there are no straight line solutions. Complex eigenvalues, seemingly I'm getting errors. I turn pink. Don't worry about it, it won't die. Keep going, let A become positive and we're back to straight line solutions again. Let's do another arrow for the other one, for the other eigenvector. I think I can just copy and paste this entire thing and modify a little bit. So I'm copying and pasting that arrow, putting a comma right here, and then changing this minus sign to a plus sign. Looks like what we need to do. I'm looking up here to see that plus sign. Again, if you, if it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. So now I got two arrows. They're both parallel to two distinct straight line solutions. But yeah, when A is negative four, it's like they merge and annihilate each other. And then there are none. But once A is bigger than zero, they reappear and separate as A continues to increase. Those are eigenvectors for any fixed value of A. That's a basis of eigenvectors. And that defines the coordinate system with which the diagonal, the corresponding diagonal matrix that you get by diagonalization defines the system for the new variable. Let's talk about that now. We better do a real case with real eigenvalues. Why don't we try one of the saddle points here? Let's let A be one. So we know when A is one, that the origin is a saddle point. What's the matrix in that case? It's one, 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 zero. Hmm. Maybe I should try one where I know for sure that the eigenvalues are gonna be nice numbers. What are the eigenvalues of A? I'm trying to avoid square roots. It may not be possible. Is there a value of A that I could pick bigger than zero where these would both be nice numbers or at least would multiply to a nice number? Uh, one doesn't work. Uh, four doesn't work. 
Oh, uh, maybe never would be a nice number. Uh, I was hoping. Well, okay, let's do it. We've got technology here. We can do it without nice numbers. Let's go ahead and do the A equals one case anyway here. What are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors in that case? I could do this. Eigen system, capital A of one. There they are. They do involve square root of five, so they're not real nice numbers. That's okay, that happens sometimes. What are those approximately? There they are. You can see one eigenvalue is positive and one is negative. The origin's a saddle point. Oh. Let's deal with it. Let's, we can do it, we can do it. Okay. So the eigenvalues end up being, according to Mathematica, Lambda equals one half plus square root of five over two and one half minus square root of five over two. Let's write it as one plus or minus square root of five over two. Those are the eigenvalues. For the first eigenvalue, one plus square root of five over two, what's the corresponding eigenvector V1? In exact form, if you take the second component to be one, the first component is the same as the eigenvalue. Huh, that's cool. I could also multiply both the top and the bottom here, both components by two to get rid of the fraction. Let's do that. Let's use. So I'm using something different than mathematic. That's okay. I can multiply an eigenvector by a non-zero scalar and get another eigenvector. <clears throat> For the other eigenvalue, one minus square root of five over two, lambda two. V two can be taken to be, it looks like one minus square root of five for the first component and two for the second. <clears throat> All right, let's diagonalize. We we'll use Mathematica help to help us. How do you diagonalize now? Write down your change of coordinates matrix. Use the eigenvectors as the columns. Does it matter which order? No, it doesn't. Though that will affect things. So you can do either order and still get a valid new system. One plus square root of five over two, um, not over two, but first upper left entry, one plus square root of five, lower left entry, two. For the second column, Upper right entry, one minus square root of five, lower right entry, two. That's gonna be my change of coordinates matrix. It's not unique. If I did not multiply the components by two here, I'd get a different matrix. P is not unique because the eigenvectors are not unique. The eigenvalues are unique, but the eigenvectors are not. There's infinitely many choices for eigenvectors. So that's gonna be my change of coordinates matrix. Let's put it into Mathematica with the square root. So we're writing it in exact form. One plus square root of five, one minus square root of five, two, two. Does P have a nice determinant? I don't know, let's see. No, that's just the way it is. So that means the inverse of P is not going to be a nice number, number matrix either, but let's see what it looks like. There's what it looks like. <clears throat> uh, 
Could it be simplified? I mean, you could rationalize those denominators if you want to, but I don't think it's going to make make it look a ton nicer. It's going to be unavoidable to still have square root of fives in there. That's okay. That's just what happens in this example. What does the theory say to do to diagonalize now? It's saying if you compute P inverse AP, it'll be a diagonal matrix. Call it D. And without even doing work, you should be able to write down what it is. There's a partial hint. What's the upper left entry going to be? The first eigenvalue, 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. And there you would need the over 2. Eigenvalues are unique. Eigenvectors are not. And the other one's going to be 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. That one's the positive one. That one's the negative one. Let's see if it happens. Matrix form. Matrix form, if it wasn't clear, is just to display output nicely. That's all, that's all it does. Inverse of P times A times P. Oh, I need A of one, sorry. Little a is one. Uh, I better simplify, slash slash simplify. There we go. So that's a diagonal matrix similar to the original matrix. It's got the same eigenvalues. I mean, it's diagonal. It's the eigenvalues are the numbers on the main diagonal. But different eigenvectors. If I do eigen system of this thing, let me give this a name. I'll call it little d. Suppress the output. If I do eigen system of D, I got the same eigenvalues, but the eigenvectors are different. Uh, those don't look like the same eigenvalues, but they are. You better confirm that. <laughs> wonder if I simplify. Okay, there we go. Sometimes things can look different, but really be the same. But look at the eigenvectors. They're very simple. One, zero, and zero, one. How'd that happen? It's because it's a diagonal matrix. That's why. With respect to the new coordinate system, the new change of variable system of differential equations is, is completely decoupled. Very easy to solve. Let's do some calculations to write down in a couple different ways what that system is. The relationship between y and u, the new variable, is this. The new variable, u, is always p inverse times the old variable, y, not p times y. P inverse times Y. The way I always remember that is that if you multiply both sides by on the left by P and then use the fact that P and P inverse are inverse matrices, I'm also using the associative property and P times P inverse is the identity matrix and the identity matrix times the vector Y is Y. This equation is equivalent to this one. And that's y equals pu, right? Okay. Y is pu. I know it's not p inverse u, but pu. That's the way I remember it, seriously. And if y is pu, then u has got to be p inverse y. We can write down the system for u abstractly. We can differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to t. Uh, du dt equals what? Well, p inverse is a constant matrix. 
it just stays as it is. Y is a function of T. So the derivative of Y with respect to T is dy dt. If I'm assuming dy dt equals A times Y, then I can just replace that derivative with A times Y. Use the associative property and write that like this. It's almost pay, but the inverse messes it up. We're not done yet though, because we need to get the differential equation all in terms of u. Well, use the fact that y equals pu. And then use the associative property again. And lo and behold, this is a magical thing. That's the diagonal matrix D. This is now DU. And we know what D is. It's a diagonal matrix with upper right entry one plus square root of five, upper left entry one plus square root of five over two and lower right entry one minus square root of five over two. By the way, the vector U I'm pretending has components little u and little v. And this derivative over here has components du dt, dv dt. With respect to the new coordinates, it's a completely decoupled system. You could guess the solution. If you want to write that solution in terms of the matrix exponential, you could do that too. The solution of the initial value problem, the generic initial value problem, du dt equals du and u of zero equals u sub zero is by the beautiful generalization, leave some space, e to the td times u zero. That's the beautiful generalization. If I wanna relate this to flows, I give it a name. Let's avoid phi because phi is gonna to correspond to the original system. How about psi, but this is not quantum mechanics. Capital psi sub u zero of t. There I'm not really thinking of it as a flow because the I'm thinking of u zero is fixed and t is the variable. I could change my perspective though. And e to the td is easy to figure out because d is diagonal. In the case where your matrix is diagonal, e to the td will also be diagonal. And along the main diagonal, the numbers will be e to those powers times t. One plus square root of five over two times t. Is that big enough for you to see there? That's a, that's a one plus square root of five over two times t. In the lower right entry, it's e to the one minus square root of five over two times t. And the other entries are still zero. We don't raise every entry to make every entry the power of e because e to the zero is one. We don't put ones there. They stay zeros. Why does, it, why does this happen? It's because of the definition of matrix exponential in terms of series. That's why I'm not going into details. Don't forget to multiply by little u sub zero, little v sub zero though. That product is ultimately the vector whose first components are is u zero e to the, I'll just call it lambda one to save time, lambda one t, v zero e to the lambda two times t where lambda one is one plus square root of five over two and lambda two is one minus square root of five over two. And because of all this, if we need to, we can go back to the original system, use the change of variables again to write the solution of the other initial value problem. 
for the original system. Solution to the IVP for the original variable and the original matrix. The beautiful generalization still implies, I'll use the psi notation of the phi notation now, that the answer has got to be e to the ta times y zero. BG means beautiful generalization. But what's e to the ta? That's the hard part. That's the the point of all the diagonalization stuff is to help us figure out e to the ta. That's the entire point. By the way, all this stuff generalizes to higher dimensions. We're doing a two by two example. You can do it for three by three, four by four, five by five, million by million. The ideals, ideas still work. The entire point of the diagonalization in this context is to compute E the TA. The entire point of the diagonalization in the context of difference equations is to compute A to the N power. With difference equations, you use a to the n power. With differential equations, you use the matrix exponential. Well, so how do you do it? Well, d equals p inverse a p is equivalent to a equaling p d p inverse. To get from here to here, Left multiply both sides by P and right multiply both sides by P inverse. And then switch the sides. Left multiplying both sides by P would give PD equals AP because the P and P inverse would cancel, so to speak. And then right multiplying both sides by P inverse leads to that. These are equivalent equations. So use it. Replace A with P, D, P inverse. Like this. All right, looks worse. Well, it's actually better. It takes some work, but you can prove that this thing can be computed as P times E to the T, D times P inverse. e to the ta can be computed in this way. And that's definitely doable. Because e to the td, we already know what that is, is this diagonal matrix. I can do that multiplication. It's not super pleasant. Square root of five is everywhere, both in p and p inverse, and even in d. And e to the td, you got these square root of fives floating around. So it would not be a super pleasant calculation, but it's doable. Let's confirm it works with Mathematica and that'll be the end. And then we'll just end class early today. And you can decide if you wanna work on homework or not. Confirm this works with Mathematica, confirm it works here. So let's confirm the matrix exponential of D, TD first. I can use a star there instead of a period. In fact, I have to, because this is a scalar times a matrix, T is a scalar. I, when I multiply a scalar times a matrix, I multiply every entry by T. When you multiply two matrices or a matrix times a vector, it's you know it's funnier, and that's why you use a different symbol for period. There we have it. That's a confirmation of what I wrote down. What's the matrix exponential of the matrix A? 
T times A? It's going to be more complicated. Yikes. Even after you simplify, it's pretty complicated. That's to be expected. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to convert, confirm. that doing this will give the same answer. That's what I'm trying to confirm here. Let's see if it happens. Matrix form. P times, now I'm using a period because I'm multiplying matrices. Matrix X of TD times the inverse of P Simplify. It's possible they could look different because Mathematica could be simplifying it in different ways, but I hope they look the same. Okay, well, it's formatting them different, but it, uh, I do believe they are the same. Certainly the upper, upper right and lower left entries look good. Comparing those, they look good. It's the upper left and lower right that are looking a little different. I'm sure they're equal. Here, okay, let's do it this way. Let's approximate this one, that output when T is say one. And let's write it as a matrix. And let's approximate this output when T is one as well and see if we get the same matrix. The percent sign refers to the preceding output. The slash dot T arrow one plugs in T equals one and matrix form makes it look like a matrix. Yay, they're the same. And it would work no matter what T is. So again, the point there was to confirm that these two things really are the same. So this goes beyond the content of the book. You know, the book doesn't talk about diagonalization, right? The book's methods are fine if you're just after a solution. But if you want to relate it to linear algebra, diagonalization, and change of coordinates, then you need to do what we're doing here. That's also useful for difference equations. It's also useful just for understanding. You are using skew coordinates, a change of coordinates to make this happen. Essentially, the, give me 15 seconds here. Essentially, when you look at this phase plane, oh, where did my Mathematica go? When you look at one of these phase planes, say one like this, in ordinary x, y coordinates, the solution is kind of complicated because you should use different coordinates. You should use skew coordinates parallel to the eigenvectors, the straight line solutions. That's the better coordinate system to use to make the system simpler. That's the entire point. Change of coordinates is a tool, just like it is for sub substitution in calculus when you do integrals. Let u equal something. It's just to help solve the problem. If you're in multivariable calculus, have you done polar coordinates? It's helpful for solving problems. That's what it's, that's what it's for.